Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our next lecture, lecture number five. And today we are going to speak about quantized spin waves in confined structures. So in this lecture, I will try to give some practical hints uh, how to calculate dispersion in a real waveguide, in real structure. So it's, of course, a bit in-depth. It's particularly should be of importance for people who, for example, do master thesis or PhD uh, in magnonics, but came from other fields. So this, I hope, will help you to take first steps. Uh, so what I'm going to discuss in this part, Kalinikov slavin model and what is PSSV, spin waves in strip wave guides and dipolar pinning. Then we will discuss just some uh, simple uh, code written in Mathematica, which my, you might use, it's open, uh, for calculating dispersion using kalinko slavin model. Then we will switch to nano wave guides to show you what is different in nano wave guides when width of wave guide is getting below, let's say, 300 nanometer or so compared to micron wave guides. Then a few words about micromagnetics with a list of codes which I use nowadays because you need to rely pretty often on micromagnetics. And finally, just a few other examples about quantizations of spin wave. Kalinikov Slavin model and perpendicular standing spin waves. So, I again would like to start with this picture. In the previous lectures, we already discussed exchange spin waves. So it means that here we need to take into account exchange interaction, the interaction between spins. And uh, uh, we also discussed in the previous lecture dipolar magnetostatic wave, where we take into account only dipole-dipolar interaction, more or less solve Maxwell equation, and we had this dispersion. But as you can see directly in this lecture, we need to take into account in reality to plot dispersion, we need to take into account both dipolar and exchange interaction. And in one of the first paper where it was done, and that is a classical paper which is used uh, nowadays everywhere, Maris Kalinikos and Andrei Slavin. Uh, Maris from, uh, from uh, St. Petersburg, Andrei Slavin is already many years professor in Oakland University in the US. And uh, yeah, this paper is named Theory of Dipolar Exchange Spin Wave Spectrum for Ferromagnetic Films with Mixed Exchange Boundary Conditions. The paper uh, is, gives you all information uh, and it gives you analytical uh, expressions to get dispersion curve. My job here is to explain you more or less, to give you a few hints how to use it. Uh, it's quite straightforward if you want to calculate dispersion. So, first they of course give you some uh, uh, geometry of the problems they're solving. So there is some uh, orientation of arbitrary orientation of the uh, film, uh, field H. Yes, and if field is H large enough, then M0 also points in the same direction. So you have these two angles, theta, you have this angle phi. Uh, you have spin wave propagating along this psi direction and here it's a cross section of the problem so thickness of the film is l and but they put the center of your coordinates in the middle of the waveguide and again you have this an, uh, angle theta and theta e you see if uh, theta e if h e if this field external field is not large enough and then strictly speaking magnetization won't point along the same axis it will be slightly tilted with respect to external field because of shape anisotropy because of demagnetization therefore pay attention there will be theta e there will be theta yeah different angles but what's important on the practical side is this uh, analytical uh, expression so here you have frequency of spin wave and here you have k which is the uh, k of uh, your spin wave wave vector wave number to be more correct and in addition we have omega h which depends on uh, applied magnetic field we have some coordinate you see it's proportion some component proportional to k square with this term alpha with the term alpha probably my pointer is empty Uh, yes, yeah, so it means that this is exchange interaction, like it's shown here. And uh, there will be some bigger term 
which describes dipole-dipole interaction. So all this geometry related magnetostatics is sitting in here. So principally, if already from this formula, you see that it takes into account exchange and dipolar interaction. And so we can describe it properly. How to find F and N? Again, there is an analytical expression. So P and N, uh, you can uh, find it, uh, yeah, so it can depend on what is the uh, number of modes and so on. Here's the expression for P and N, which you can find. But uh, important is that there are this angle, theta and uh, phi. Yeah, and the key n also it's uh, critical that it takes into account two wave numbers. One is propagating along the waveguide, like it's shown here. It's a key psi. Uh, but there is also this kappa n, which describes a standing thickness mode. Yeah, so we have quantization over the thickness, and that's how it's in. Uh, plugged it in, and principally this Kn means that you need to take into account both of them. Okay, uh, so that's how uh, kind of which formulas you need to, to use. Yeah, so here are numbers of formulas. It means there was a lot of mathematics before, which you went through. And uh, this kappa n, as I said, it's a quantization over the thickness. So you see it's pi over L, L is the thickness of the mode, and n is just an integer which takes from uh, starts from 0, 1, 2. If n equals 0, it means lowest uh, thickness mode. It means that magnetization over the thickness will be uniform. Good. Here actually how these modes look like. So here n is not shown uniform mode n equals zero, then it would be just uniform n uh, precession. But it's shown how it looks first, second, third, and fifth mode. And you see that this amplitude, it shows actually um, amplitude of magnetization precession. So it means that here in the middle, you can have larger magnetization precession as at the edges. And uh, or vice versa, you can have larger angle magnetization precession at the edges and smaller and zero in the middle. Yeah, so that's how our thickness modes look like. Usually, you can excite even modes one, three, or five with uniform magnetic field applied, alternate RF field, because kind of area of this part is larger than area of this one. Therefore, when you apply uniform field, the easiest, of course, to excite this one because it's in the phase, all magnetization here. But here, for example, it's anti-phase. It means this one has opposite phase to this one. And if you put all this in the uniform magnetization field, you're trying to excite here, but you, at the same time, you are trying to suppress magnetization on the other side. Therefore, uniform magnetic field won't excite um, even modes. But for old modes, this and this will be compensated uh, because they have antiphase, but there will be still rest of something. So you still can excite third mode, fifth, and so on, but the excitation efficiency drops down when you go to higher and higher order thickness mode. The same happens about width modes, but now let us speak about thickness mode mainly. Uh, what also uh, Kalinikoslavian did, they introduced this uh, parameter of pinning. The point is that you can have pinned or unpinned spins at the surface of your, of your film. So you have thin film, and uh, if and spins at the surface can be fixed, they don't process, or they can process with large angle. Uh, it's a very important issue in practice. And here in this graph already, you see the situation for pinned case. So here means n equal one, uh, that we have zero precession angle at the edges and maximum is the minimum in, in the center. So this is a pinned case. It means pins are not precessing at the edges, on the surfaces. And n equal to all these other modes are shown for unpinned case because angle of precession here is large, as it's shown here, and is smaller in the middle. And the uh, uh, theory of Kalinikoslavin gives you understanding, can, uh, you can put principally any state of the spin, uh, pinning. And uh, if d equals zero, it means that spins are completely unspinned. They can process either the same as in the middle if it's uniform mode, or larger if it's some higher order standing modes. 
Or if spin, uh, pinning is completely pinned, so if there is no procession, if spins are completely pinned, D goes to infinity. Please also pay attention that we have these two parameters, D1 and D2. That means that pinning at the top surface and at the bottom surface are different, can be different. At the bottom, if it's classical yttrium iron garnet material, usually there is GGG substrate in which it's growing. There will be some transient layer with pure yeek and uh, with unpure yeek, and then it will be hard to tune to pinning at this surface. You still can, of course, during the growth, you can try to do something, but then that's it. The top surface, principally, besides simple magnet uh, electrodynamics, so there are some uh, electrodynamically or magnetostatically, uh, pins prefer to be unpinned in the thickness mode when it's infinitely large film. But people have found a way how to make them pinned. So there are some old papers when people did some chemical treatment, or you can put some metal or find some other way to change pinning at the surface. Therefore, principally in practice, you can change uh, at least one of them uh, if possible. Yeah, and here's uh, the demonstrator, what means unpin key. So this is a zero mode, which means magnetization precession is uniform over the whole thickness. So we see angle of precession is large everywhere. And here we see almost pinned case. You still have, it's not fully pinned because there is still some precession here at the surfaces, but precession in the middle is larger. So it means that this partially pinned case, like it's shown. So that's what means pinning. And these are our surfaces. L is uh, thickness of the film, like it's defined in Kalinikos line. And here it's shown for how modes look like for Mm, uh, pinned case and for unpinned case. So for unpinned, zero mode means such uniforms that angle of precession is the same everywhere, like it's shown here. And equal one means maximal at the one side, and here is maximal also but opposite sign. This is second mode and so on. For pinned case of partially pinned case, the modes are defined like this. So principally, this one is the same zero mode. But it happens that in literature, usually this mode is named first mode and equal one. That's why I have one, like you can find it in literature more often. But in brackets, I show you zero because principally you can have transition from this mode one to another. Uh, but then second mode would look like this. That would be third mode, which we often see in experiment for, but not for sickness, for width modes and so on. So that's the profiles of the modes across the thickness. Yeah, so this is thickness. It's not a width, it's the thickness of the waveguide. Okay. And now, yes, please. What are the physical reasons on microscopic uh, letters? Like, why is pinning or unpinning happening? Like, why is pinning happening along the surfaces? Is it some kind of surface structure or defects? Or what is like? Yeah. So, what is causing pinning here? You mean? Yeah, it's a good question. So, the question is uh, what can be the physical mechanism that we will get a pinning here at the surfaces? Let's say at the top surface, one, one which you can modify. Um, I would say it might be really a strain kind of issue. So, if you. Um, if you etched uh, or you introduced some inhomogeneities or something, did something with your surface, there might be strain which will change magnetization properties. Some people mentioned something that uh, since uh, yeek is such a, has such a huge um, lattice constant, 1.2 nanometer, and there are 160 atoms in one unit cell, uh, then uh, it's also important how you etched out where you cut more or less your uh, your surface, and which spins are on the surface, yeah? Uh, this might matter, uh, but uh, I think it would definitely strongly depend on the, if you will put another magnetic material with larger magnetization, for example, or so, which will then uh, probably simply there will be exchange interaction and you will keep that pinned. Um, if you will put non-magnetic metal, you still will change uh, boundary conditions from aquasol equation, so also something will happen. So I think there, are, there might be different physical mechanisms where how we can tune a bit the pinning. Pin. Okay, 
Okay. Good. Next question. What is the difference between higher order or higher or higher order thickness modes versus perpendicular standing spin waves? Higher order thickness modes, this is what we had in the Damon Ashbach paper. And these modes look like that. And you see that they all start with the same point from uh, fMR frequency in the in-plane magnetized film. If you speak about propagating spin wave spectroscopy, a uh, propagating, sorry, perpendicular standing spin waves, there's another term very similar, uh, but here we need PSSV, perpendicular standing spin wave. You see that these are also thickness modes, but they always start from different frequency, like it's shown here, as opposite to this one. So there is always. So what's going on here? When you will have quantization over the thickness, so it means you will have standing wave here. And usually your thickness is small. For example, even if you will take classical yttermine garnet waveguide, then it will be five micron thick. And if you will get some standing wave, it means that your wavelengths will be also of micron. Or if you go to nanometer, wavelengths will be then of order of nanometer. And what does it mean? It means that if you do not take into account exchange interaction, nothing changes because there is dipole-dipolar interaction and it doesn't care, it's already more or less saturated. But in reality, we have to take into account exchange interaction. So it means that when you have large K propagating along the waveguide, yes, yeah, so short and shorter wavelengths, at some point this portion starts to go K squared up due to exchange. But also, when you have quantization over the thickness and you have standing waves here, you also bring energy, exchange energy, also k squared, like it's shown here. So it means that if you have small k for parallel wave propagating along, so it's pure magnetostatic, but you have very short wavelengths across the thickness, you will get here energy from exchange. That's why higher order thickness modes like it's shown here, they should start from higher and higher frequency. If you're speaking about uh, micron thick yik, then the separation will be of order of 10 megahertz. If you take 50 nanometer thick yik, then this separation will be already of order of 1 gigahertz. So there will be higher and higher modes. But historically, it happens that um, we are speaking about PSSV, usually these are these waves. Yeah, so you might ask, why is this dispersion, this PSSV goes then up? And why actually they start, some goes down, some goes up? So it's not fully clear in this figure. Uh, but what, what is plotted here is actually a dispersion for K propagated perpendicular to, to spin wave, uh, to applied field and parallel. So all this, all these modes are shown for backward volume waves and they go down. Uh, frequency due to uh, magnetostatics, and then exchange brings them k-square up. These lines, it is also backward volume. Although it's shown that it's perpendicular, don't mix up it with Damon Ashbach, because Damon Ashbach magnetostatic surface spin waves do not have higher order thickness modes. Uh, but backward volume waves, as you remember, this Damon Ashbach curves, they all start from the same line, which is just flat line, which means that spin wave doesn't propagate. So backward volume, it does exist. So if it's your field orientation, this is the most comfortable condition for backward volume when it propagates along. Then it propagates slower, slower, slower. And when it's perpendicular, it doesn't propagate. Group velocity is equal to zero, but it still exists. And this is like what's shown here. It's really backward volume for this standing, uh, for uh, direction perpendicular to the propagation, of, to the field. And uh, you see it's flat. It means group velocity is zero. But frequency is different. These are resonances, which goes up and up because of exchange interaction. So this is what perpendicular standing spin wave is. Yeah, so see the difference with and without taking into account exchange. That's what matters here. How to calculate frequency for PSSVs? Uh, so here I show you analytical expression. So it looks similar to the dispersion curve, but there is no K in there. So it's not to calculate wave, it's calculate these frequencies, oscillations. So resonance frequencies. And you see that they depend again on a field, effective field. It means that you need to take into account the mark if you have and so on. 
exchange constant and thickness of the film given as L shown here. And uh, so that's the formula. Uh, you can also see um, these papers, for example, here shown, Stefan Klinger has shown how to, you can measure uh, uh, the standing waves with, uh, f uh, using ferromagnetic resonance in order to characterize the film. So then you will be able to get this e exchange to subtract from the measurements in order to, uh, uh, in order to, uh, yeah, characterize the material simply. One more important issue, so-called gaps in the space spectrum, dipolar gaps in a spin wave spectrum, like it's shown here. Again, these gaps are already properly described in the Kalinikos Slavin. It's one of the topics. And this is something what we see in the experiment. So if you're working especially with thick yik, like micron thick yik, you will get Damon Ashbrook dispersion or magnetostatic surface spin wave dispersion. So in this paper, together with uh, Alexander Sirica, so uh, Burkhard Hillebrands, we investigated so-called storage recovery of data in this, uh, in this uh, gaps. A bit tricky experiment, I don't go into the details, but the, stand, uh, the starting point was that we have Damon Ashbach and we have PSSV, we change their frequency, and there will be anti-crossing between them. So if you have two dispersion of this resonance and this Damon Ashbach mode, there will be anti-crossing and there will be a gap. And in our experiments, it means the following. If you take simple propagated spin wave spectroscopy, two antenna to excite spin wave to detect spin wave. That's what is shown here on this axis. And you measure it as a function of frequency using vector network analyzer. That is a typical transmission for Damon Ashbach for MSSV. But because of standing thickness mode, you will have gaps. Here, one gap, second, third, and so on. And actually, this is a very good sample where spins are strongly unpinned, where we don't practically, these gaps are very small. Because in some other cases, like it's shown here, for example, this gap, so here's the Ashbach, yeah? This line here is a standing mode, PSSV, and that's an anti-crossing. Yeah, and Kalinikos Slavin, their model also describes very good this anti-crossing. You can gap all, get all these gaps. And the, the size of these gaps depends on the pinning on the surfaces. So there were samples specially developed in a way to keep this pinning as small as possible uh, because a small pinning, so large precession angle, then this anti-crossing is uh, not so pronounced, it's small. So these gaps are small, so this is a sample with small pinning. But there, is, there are cases where people on purpose uh, pin them and then you will see here pronounced such uh, band gaps, which are simply because of the anti-crossing between propagating wave and standing waves. Therefore, please be careful when you work with these waves. Uh, one little detour. If you will take micrometer thick, five micron thick yik, let's say 200 mi mi millitesla, and you will calculate uh, dispersion for MSSV wave for Damon Ashbach using Kalinikoslavian approach, you will see such behavior that it goes up and then this person drops down and only afterwards starts to behave K-square. This is not physical behavior, don't mix up because there is nothing in your system which could decrease energy. In reality, this person for this way would go like this, it goes first here, then it would saturate like dipolar waves like we studied, and then it goes up. The reason for this uh, 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 deep here is uh, simply that this is analytical uh, expression and analytics means that somewhere they took uh, some approximations to, to be able to get this analytical formula. And if you work with this, so six sample in this K region of K, principally you go outside of the limitations, so your theory should not work in this case. Therefore, just be ready that um, uh, this analytics does not properly describe it for the thicknesses. If you will go to 100 nanometer or 40 nanometer thick samples, then principally it works already good. Therefore, you can be more relaxed, but be, uh, be careful with this uh, uh, little situation. Other questions to this part? Yes, please. I had a question about anti-crossing. 
what's the physical reasons why those skin waves from different kinds propel each other? Because they all both are mm, both are in the same media. For both waves, it's a magnetization precession, but in one case, it's such a, which propagates in a formal way, and then for another, it's standing. And physical reason is the same as so any two coupled oscillators. So you have two coupled oscillators, mechanics or anything. As long as you couple them, that they feel each other, they will be uh, splitting. Or in atom physics, when you put uh, hydrogen atom, hydrogen atom into hydrogen molecule, you immediately will get bonding and debonding state. Again, they will be splitting energy. Or in all this quantum magnetics, uh, that's what's named nowadays cavitronics. Uh, you put, take the sphere, put it into the micro resonator. As soon as you tune field, the resonance of frequency of sphere comes close to the resonance of uh, uh, your cavity, you immediately will get anti crossing. So, all resonances. Uh, so, it's kind of very general principle that uh, the splitting of the modes always exists. Yeah. Happy? Uh, as soon as they interact, yeah, they cannot, uh, so as soon as interactions, they will be anti-crossing. If they would be, one would be phonon and another would be magnon, uh, and uh, in a material without magnetostriction or something where magnetoelasticity is small, then they would coexist, like, or like light, yeah, when you can... Uh, with two pocket lamps, you can shine, they don't uh, feel each other. Then there will be no anti-crossing. But if there is, uh, uh, if there is a uh, uh, interaction, then expect anti-crossing. The same, for example, directional coupler. When we have two waveguides in uh, magnet, so placed close to each other, that they uh, interact in due to the stray field, dipole dipolar, then you will have also anti-crossing, but not in one point like here but the whole dispersion will be split into symmetric and asymmetric mode. It's also the same physics, but a bit more complicated because it's uh, then the whole dispersion splits and then you have this uh, directional coupler mechanism and energy is jumping one to another. It's also all about more or less the same physics. So uh, then we continue with spin waves in strip waveguides, dipole and discuss so-called dipolar pinning phenomena. As I said at the very beginning of the lecture, what makes spin wave different from light, for example, is that spin wave doesn't propagate in air, and usually we send it in the form in such a waveguide, which has thickness D or L, like it was in Kalinikos line, with W, K is oriented along. But if we have quantization over the thickness or over the width, so principally we need to take into account all three K vectors. But for us, the most important, the one which is oriented along the waveguide because it carries information. Yeah, and we need to magnetize our waveguide in one of uh, the directions. So, in this lecture, I would like to give you some practical hints how to calculate dispersion properly, what to pay attention, and to give an understanding where the dispersion comes from. And first, what we need to think about is internal field, because as we know from previous courses, depending how you magnetize your waveguide, field can be uniform or non-uniform, it can be the same as external field or not the same. And here the best case is backward volume geometry, when field is applied along the waveguide, it means that it is uniform inside and it means that internal field is equal to external, if it's infinitely long, but usually lens is really orders, orders of magnitude long, larger than width or uh, thickness of the waveguide. So in this case, we have the magnetization field zero and internal field is uniform. So uh, here are different letters here, how people use it internal, H zero can be, sometimes people speak about uh, uh, effective field and the applied field is usually uh, denoted as H external. Uh, so it's a good situation. Situation is getting much more tricky if you are speaking about magnetostatic surface spin waves or the Ashbach geometry, because in this case we need to apply field perpendicular to the waveguide, and the magnetization is not zero, and it gives us two important conclusions. That first of all, field inside is smaller, 
and second, that this field is non-uniform. So how to deal with it? If to, you want to calculate internal field properly or spin wave dynamics properly, you need to do micromagnetic simulations. Uh, I will show it to you a bit later. Uh, but you can get some impression um, analytically. For example, what is shown here is effective field inside of waveguide as a function of coordinate across the waveguide. So I took it from the dissertation of Thomas Brecher from two Kaiserslautern, but I think he used this formula from other source which he refers inside in his thesis. So there is, a quite an, uh, there is an analytical expression how to calculate effective field as a function of external for, uh, for this uh, uh, function of position Z, yeah? and there is width of waveguide W. Uh, so what is, which material is calculated here? It's, uh, it's permalloy, nickel 81, iron 19. And uh, it's a material, it's a metal, it's an alloy with quite large saturation magnetization. And we apply external field 20 millitesla, which is not very large field. Therefore, as a result, we see the following situation. This green line shows us external field, which is applied. And internal field, because of demagnetization, is twice smaller, even in the best case when it's in the middle. You see that it's staying here. The waveguide is around two micron, 195 micron wide. So principally it means that all this is waveguide. But you see this interesting situation that here it's zero. And the reason that that's simply analytics, what is happening in this re regions actually, it's not that internal field is zero, but is this are the regions where magnetization is pointing still along the waveguide. So when you have waveguide, shape anisotropy wants to keep that parallel. And then when you apply magnetization, uh, it will be already oriented perpendicular to waveguide in the middle, but at the edges, shape anisotropy still will be larger. It will be pointing along. That's why we have these regions. And therefore, be always careful what's going on at the edges of your waveguides. Principally, if you want to magnetize it full, fully, it's possible, but you need to apply a significantly larger field. So then these regions are clear. And in addition, there will be a, some non-uniform distribution, uh, like it's shown here, for example. And uh, uh, spin wave, and it will run through this waveguide, it still will be eigen mode. So there will be one mode which propagates with one frequency in this very non-uniform magnetization. And in this case, one can introduce some effective widths, which will be smaller than the real widths of the waveguide. Where exactly it is, there is, so at least I cannot give you such a simple answer. Uh, so for example, in this case, Thomas, he selected simply value at the half of the magnetization, and he said, this might be an effective width. And probably spin wave will take it really close. But in reality, uh, it's a tricky question. And the best, what I would recommend you to do, to use numerics, yeah, micromagnetic simulations to, to get an answer. Be also careful about edges, because even if it's magnetized perpendicular here, still you have regions with much smaller internal field. And there is such phenomena as uh, edge spin wave modes. When you have waveguide magnetized perpendicular, and then you can have two types of spin wave. For higher frequencies, there will be spin wave which will select somewhere here region and will propagate in the middle of waveguide. And for smaller frequencies, there will be another edge mode which propagates here at the edges. So I don't put it in the lecture, but please, please keep in mind that edge modes exist and play an important role. Uh, good. Um, so now, next question is, of course, a pinning. So we have discussed a lot pinning in terms of um, surface pinning. So when we had plain film, like Kalinikos Slavin, they considered plain film, and they had pinning at the top and bottom surface. Uh, now we forget about sickness mode, but coming back to the width mode, because we can have quantization over the width. And again, it's a question, what is going on with the pinning at the edges? And uh, 
Uh, usually there will be some partial pinning. So we have here the phenomena of dipolar pinning. So it means the following. If you have waveguides, spin wave propagates. If spins are unpinned at the edges, it means you have large precession angle. And it means there will be a lot of emission of electromagnetic wave or simply large uh, magnetic component of the field outside of the waveguide. Large field, large volume means that it costs energy, dipolar energy. And usually it's like in the uh, story about formation of domain walls when there is an interplay between dipolar energy and exchange energy and crystallography um, or anisotropy. In this case also, system is searching for a way to minimize parasitic energy. Therefore, there is phenomenon of dipolar pinning, which pins, pins at the edges that to minimize uh, irradiation of the field outside. Therefore, and if you take waveguide of some, I don't know, 5 micron wide or so, uh, then most, like, uh, uh, most likely the uh, spins will be practically pinned at the edges. And uh, yeah, how to estimate it? What is, how strong is pinning? Yeah, and if you go to 1 micron or so, there will be partial unpinning. So it will be then a bit more complicated to deal with. How, to, uh, how do we usually deal with spinning at the edges? If it's magnetostatic surface spin waves, we cannot do much with analytics because we already have some efficient widths. So we don't really know how wide is waveguide, that one which spin wave uses to propagate. And what is the uh, pinning conditions, it's all uh, already kind of makes no sense to discuss. But story again is better for backward volume geometry. Because in this case, we have uh, uniform magnetization inside and pinning can be estimated analytically. So this is from this formula taken from Stansel Prabhakar, you see there will be some uh, dipolar pinning parameter which depends on omega, which is width of wave guide and L, which is its thickness. And then you can get parameters simply from geometry which gives you how strong is dipolar pinning. And what we do afterwards, we introduce a new parameter of effective width because analytically you can use the same Kalinikoslavian model and everything is getting easier if you consider case of full pinning. When mode goes, it's like sinus or cosine, it goes to zero point. And for this, what you do, so here you see the mode profile. This is our waveguide, that's width. And amplitude in this case shows the amplitude of precession. So it's maximum in the middle and it's smaller at the edges, but not zero. What you can do in this case, you can extrapolate this profile like it's shown here. And then you're dealing with so-called, you can come into this point where it's zero and you can describe this real mode in terms of full pinned keys, but you need to replace your widths with widths effective. So it means you kind of introduce in your formula higher widths and uh, uh, you consider fully pinned case. In this case, fits effective can be found like it's shown here. So it's also analytically can be calculated. And principally in many cases, this approach, this trick works quite good. How do we calculate formula in the waveguide? So now what we do, we take Kalinikoslavian model but they didn't discuss uh, waveguides. So we need to introduce additional information in order to switch to a waveguide. And um, uh, what's also important that here, I don't take into account thickness mode. So we need to take into account only a parallel component propagating wave along the waveguide and standing wave perpendicular to the waveguide. So k total in this case can be found by the simple formula. K par perpendicular, these are our standing components. And k uh, parallel, that's what we need. So it means that in the uh, Kalinikoslavian formula, you should put uh, you should put this k total in the formula. So you see these are the formulas which we have seen already. But instead of using simply k, uh, like it was k parallel only, now we need to take into account both components, k squared 
and this quantization k perpendicular. So k perpendicular is simply found like this, pi divided by w effective. So you see effective, it can be different effective, whatever you are working with, bind, uh, with backward volume or the m and -Bach, you need to find proper effective width. And m, it's just an integer. So it's zero, one, two, that you just check what is the quantization. So if you want to use Kalinikov Slavin for, uh, for the uh, your uh, to calculate dispersion as a waveguide, you need first of all to replace k and to take into account this higher width mode, which is staying not only in the main formula, but also in this f. But second, what you should not forget is angle, because if you have here an uh, angle, yeah, in the Kalinikov Slavin, there was an angle, here it's written theta k, it's an angle between um, uh, the so let's say there are two angles, theta, M, uh, theta m, it's an angle between k parallel and magnetization, simply to distinguish backward volume and the Menesberg geometry or so. But in addition, there is another angle, theta k, which more or less is, uh, gives you angle between uh, k parallel and k perpendicular. So what you need to do, you need to plug in this both angles, like it's shown here, and this angle theta k again depends on this m, on the number of quantization, but it also depends on the k parallel. And then if you will use this formula, you will use g, you will plug everything into f, and you will plug everything here. You can get analytical expression for the mode, for, uh, uh, yeah, so you can get this spin wave dispersion in a waveguide, analytically. Let us try to understand how this quantization over the width changes our dispersion for spin wave which propagates along, yeah? One can think, okay, they are independent. I have a wave which runs along the waveguide and it's always the same, doesn't matter how much uh, quantization I have perpendicular, but it's not the case because you need to take into account both. And as just idea, I will try to show you with this curve with this graph, it might be a bit tricky, but let's try to go through it. So let's start with this dashed line, red and blue. So it's wave number, it's a function of frequency, so it's simple dispersion. And this dashed line show us dispersion based on pure Kalinikov Slavin without any waveguide for plane films. And they both start with this FMR frequency, like it's shown here, then Damon Ashbach goes up and exchange starts to bring it up. Backward volume goes down and brings it up. Now, uh, let us have a look onto the for example, let's have a look on this curve. Now what is shown here, this blue solid, it's the Ashbach mode, mode which propagates along, but it's for one micron white Yitrimarin Garnet waveguide. Uh, so theta m is equal to zero, w is one. And this is for the first width mode. So it means that we have quantization over the width. And you see that this mode starts from the higher frequency. And then when you increase and increase k, this is k parallel in fact, these two modes will overlap. So they will be identical as soon as you are going heat there. Why is that? Simply because of this formula. Yeah? So as soon as your k parallel is very large compared to k perpendicular, then you can forget about quantization perpendicular to the waveguide. But this formula also shows you that if k parallel is very small, then actually k perpendicular plays a dominant role. Therefore, with the beginning of this dispersion curve changes significantly. That's what we need to keep in mind, that quantization over the width changes dispersion, particularly at the beginning, and it starts from higher width, from higher frequency, this first width mode. Why does it start from higher width? Just a finger explanation. If k parallel equals zero, then k perpendicular will be some quantized value, yeah, so one pi over f omega effective, and in fact, this wave is a Damon Eschbach mode, but standing, not propagating, Damon Eschbach. And Damon Eschbach, for larger k, has 
higher frequency. So here's your Damon Eschbach. Then if you take this pi over omega effective parallel, you can just draw properly this line approximately. And then it means that your backward volume wave should start from the point which corresponds to this standing mode in Damon Eschbach. This, this arrow shows you where it should start, just to give you an understanding why it starts to move up, and like shown here. Uh, what, how it behaves for the wave for Damon Eschbach? For Damon Eschbach, this mode we will discuss now. It's shifted down because of the Mach, but if I switch off just artificial demagnetization, the dispersion would, would look like this one for the first width mode. And you see that it starts from lower frequency. Backward volume, higher modes goes up, and for Damon Eschbach, it goes down. Why? Again, exactly the same, because now this point, k parallel equals zero for Damon Eschbach, means standing wave for backward volume. And that means that we need to find some effective value, but already perpendicular. And then we plot where our backward volume is, and this is the beginning of our dispersion. That's why it behaves like it's shown here. Uh, but if you are coming to real situation with Damon Eschbach, it will be different because you need to take into account so this dashed line, dotted line, it's without demagnetization. But with demagnetization for backward volume waves, it's shifted down because the internal field is smaller. So that's how it looks like for, back, for the Eschbach mode. So I hope this point is clear that you can understand how in which direction the, our mode starts. Also, don't forget that if you plot the situation, yeah, the next thickness mode will be here. It will start. For, oh, let's let's have a look. Yeah, this one. Uh, it will start for lower frequency, so it means second mode will go down, 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 but only until some time. At some point, because of exchange already in the along the waveguide, it starts moving. So your modes will be moving it like first, third, fifth, seventh, and then, depending on parameters, starting from some ninth mode or something, they will start moving back in opposite direction. Therefore, just keep in mind that uh, all these modes can be tricky, but uh, it's good that we understand the main idea behind why they behave like this. Other questions to this part? No. <laughs> okay, good. That was a theoretical background. Now we will switch to practical story. So imagine you're a master's or PhD student. You came from different topic. You want to do spin waves, how to start with. Of course, the best is to, to check paper of Kalinikov Slavin and at least once to go through it. But in order to make what we did at some point together with uh, Dmitro Boshko, who is now professor in Colorado Springs, we have drawn, uh, made some simple code in Mathematica. And yesterday night he placed it on uh, GitHub, so everybody who is interested principally can download it and use it. Uh, the code itself, the core, so it does only Kalinikov Slavin, uh, with taking into account of uh, all these things. So principally, it's just analytics, there is no simulations, so you don't solve anything. Um, Code looks horrible, so for, for programmers, uh, sorry, you probably will hate it. But the trick is that we wanted to use uh, Mathematica um, in order to get such a nice interface, where you can just write whatever you like, press a button and it calculates. And Mathematica is not the software developed for using such interface. Therefore, code is bulky with repetition and so on. But principally, it works okay, was tested, and you will, can use it uh, to test, for example, first what I would do, I would compare dispersion calculated quasi uh, analytically, not quasi, it's just analytically, with numerics, and just see what's going on. And uh, so this would be a nice first step to help. So what do you see in this program? Uh, here is just information about how it calculates, uh, which sources also in the same uh, uh, folder there will be uh, brief tutorials, so kind of manual, how to uh, play with this program, how what it does. But what you do, you just plug in some uh, external field, you choose material, so there is some selection just to help you, but important is of course thickness, 
then matter magnetization, exchange constant, which this uh, uh, scroll box uh, gives you some of initial values which you can modify. It takes into account also anisotropy. In the second, in one of the next paper from, uh, I think Michael Kostele already introduced, modified this theory further, he introduced uh, anisotropy. And then if you want to calculate things like free pass, lifetime, and so on, you, for this you also need uh, alpha and delta H0, so ferromagnetic resonance. And then at the end you choose either plain film or a waveguide of a given width in microns. And on the right side you have some technical issues what to calculate. So how many width modes you want to calculate. This one calculates also thickness modes from Kalinikos, so we can define how many is, uh, thickness modes. Uh, how many points you want to, to calculate in which range. And then there are little tricks. Uh, for example, you can switch off the magnetization, which is uh, sometimes helps you to understand what's going on. You can use this effective width for backward volume, like I said, or some effective width for MSSV. You can switch off uh, anisotropy. Uh, sometimes it's important. Uh, lifetime, yes, yeah, so here when it calculates lifetime, it takes into account also electricity of precession. Sometimes you want to have pure lifetime, which depends only on the uh, frequency, then you can switch off it here. And this last check bo bo uh, checkbox, uh, you remember in the last lecture, I have shown you simple analytical expressions. Sometimes they are also interested when you want to get rid of exchange and just to see only dipolar. So this checkbox would give you just simplest dispersion. So that's what it does, and here is an example. So it gives you dispersion, but here it's interesting that it also gives you an, a group, group velocity, free pass, lifetime, and ratio of uh, free pass divided by the wavelength. So you can play around, you can switch on off different modes, you can save data and so on, different routine. But principally for quick and dirty analysis, this code can be helpful. Yeah, and there are, so, there are this uh, checkbox with mode, sickness mode, single mode, uh, so you can, uh, this mode means that uh, thickness mode is always zero. Thickness mode means that width mode is always zero, but sometimes maybe you will need to have some given width and thickness modes, and for this we have separate uh, code. And there is calculated parameters, so here are just some internal parameters which might help you, like uh, internal magnetic field, exchange constant in different parameters, what is omega h, omega m, what is tau, lifetime, and so on, which might help you in your practical work. So that's uh, so much about this analytical expression. And now we want to make a step towards nanowave guides. Other questions to previous part? Oh, that's good. Okay. Nanowave guides. So what is the difference? What means nanowave guides? Nanowave guides means that the width of waveguide is at least below one micron. But in reality, we see qualitative change in physics when we go to the width of waveguide for, I don't know, 400 nanometers thick gig, around 300 nanometers. So that's where something changes physically. And what changes, we will get such phenomena as exchange unpinning. So that's already very recent. It's published, well, not very, a few years, but it's already, um, something which is not as well known as Kalinikos Lavin. And uh, now I will show you, uh, say a few words, how to calculate a dispersion in the nano waveguide. First question, how to make this nano waveguide? So this is a technology which was developed in Kaiserslautern. Now we use it also uh, in, uh, and in SciTech, uh, Michal Urbanek and uh, his colleagues, have, they have developed a new technology. But in our case, we were using just galligadelinium yig, plain film, usually it's liquid phase epitaxy, yig grown on GGG substrate by Karsten Dubs. And then we put two layers of PMMA, then we do e-beam lithography in order to get such a nice uh, opening after you deposit and develop it. Then we use hard mask of double metal, chromium titanium has shown good results. But be careful with chromium, Majitanana says that it uh, damages yig because it takes uh, oxygen out of yig. For cro uh, chromium is always an issue. Um, be careful, but at the end of the day, we will make such a metal mask 
and we put it in argon etching. And you etch, and everything what is not covered by this mask will be etched down. Then we etch a bit down to the GGG that we have only the standing wave with a rest of chromium on top. And then chromium etch, and we will get such a nice standing yeek on GGG waveguide. And this one, we will have such a nice waveguide and principally width of the waveguide on top. So it, it still look, has trapezoidal cross-section, but at the top, principally to 30 nanometer, we, uh, we can go, which is already very attractive uh, because it's getting a bit closer to CMOS. CMOS, of course, is smaller still sizes, but, uh, but it's already somewhere there. And uh, so that's the nano waveguide. And now the question, when we fabricated it first, what we did, we just made the following experiment. So uh, Chi Wan can be on Heinz. Uh, she was uh, the lead author. They both actually uh, uh, lead authors, but she was on a uh, numerical site at the time and Bjorn was on fabrication site and uh, measured, I think, uh, either together or Bjorn was measuring. So um, this is GGG substrate and then uh, we just made such a nano waveguide of different widths and we placed them on micro strip antenna. So all waveguides are uh, explored by the same microwave field in the same uh, uh, uniform field. So it means that we are excited magnetization precession in them. But we want to check magnetization precession in them individually. And what you can do for this, you will use brilliant light scatter in spectroscopy. And uh, mm, because then you can focus light on one of the waveguides, there will be scattered photons, which we analyze and we can say what is a magnetization precession angle. So BLS, it's a topic in two lectures. We will discuss how BLS works. And then what we did, we measured ferromagnetic resonance in white waveguide, one micron, and in narrow waveguide, 50 nanometers. And we see that it's for one micron, we have resonance here around five gigahertz. And for 50 nanometers, it's 5.4 gigahertz, approximately 5.35. And it would be all good. Yeah, so this is all shown in this paper, 2019. It all would be nice, uh, but theory has shown that actually it should not be the case because when we calculated uh, the frequency of this mode as a function of uh, waveguide width, if you use simply pinned spins, taking into account dipolar pinning, we would expect this frequency to be around 11 gigahertz. Uh, there is another theory of Konstantin Guslienko who takes into account uh, very properly all the spin pinning and so on, but that analytical formula of quasi analytics works only for the waveguide, which we have widths much larger than thickness. And in our case, we came more or less 50 to 50 nanometer. And therefore, Kalinikos, uh, so uh, Guslienko also did not pr describe properly the, this uh, situation because our experimental point was this. Therefore, first for us, it was a surprise that we expected that we will get very big frequency and instead we still have just small increase in the frequency. So now after analysis, we have realized what is going on. If you have one micron wide waveguide, you will get pinned spins, partially pinned. So you see here, this is a precession angle, or here's precession is smaller at the edges that in the middle, and the middle is larger, and that's how your mode looks like. It's simulated. If you would take not one micron wide, but two or three microns, then it would go practically to zero, there would be pinning. And if you go to 50 nanometer wave wave, guys, we have a big change because now spins are getting unpinned at the edges. And your, uniform, and your mode is getting uniform, such a nice mode where precession angle is the same, and so on. And why is that? Again, like in the story with uh, uh, domain wall formation, where there is a competition between different energy contributions, here we have dipolar pinning, which wants to minimize precession angle of the spins at the edges, yeah, and it wants to keep them pinned. But the spinning means that there will be angle between neighboring spins. And uh, which uh, uh, contribution is unhappy with angle between neighboring spins? Rusty, which 
energy wants to keep its spins parallel. Exchange contributions, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, and then what happens here, dipolar, we minimize dipolar energy, but we increase exchange energy because there will be uh, angle between spins. Therefore, and but it doesn't matter if width of waveguide is very large. But as soon as you go to 50 nanometer, this angle starts to play a role and exchange interaction increases, energy of exchange interaction. Therefore, starting from 300 nanometer, it depends on many parameters, but approximately, we will get situations that exchange contribution, which one spins to be parallel, will be dominating over the dipolar pinning parameter. And then instead of dipolar pinning, we named it exchange unpinning. And then all spins will be parallel, and we kind of forget about dipolar pinning. So that's why nanoscale structures, we principally don't ignore like spin torque nano oscillators. So some people just ignore dipolar pinning at all. But the reason is that simply exchange interaction is dominant here. Good. And this is qualitatively what you need to take into account because dispersion will be then different. Yeah, and you need, and the modes profile will be different. And you need then to take into account how to deal with spin wave modes in the nanoscale. Uh, so here you see the simulated in MUMAX uh, dispersions for 5 micron wide waveguides and for 200 nanometer. Another bonus you get when you go to nanoscale that this higher width mode, they are well separated now in space, in frequency. And uh, with waveguide, usually having many modes means a lot of problem. You want to excite spin wave here, it propagates and want, you want to work all the time with single mode waveguide. In reality, as soon as you have more modes for higher other frequencies, as soon as you will have band of your waveguide or non-uniformity or something else, all of them will be populated on the same frequency due to two magnet scattering effect. Therefore, if you want to have pure processing of data, you need to decrease width of your waveguide and to shift higher width mode higher. Then you can work in all this frequency range without possibility to scatter elastically into higher width modes. And here, in addition uh, on, uh, to numerics, there is this dashed line. So this theory de developed by Roman Verba from Kiev and uh, Institute of Magnetism. And you see that principally his quasi-analytics describes very well the uh, numerics. And here is also his quasi-analytics, uh, this green line, and points this is experiment for k equals zero for this FMR mode. Uh, how these modes look like. So this is uh, opposite to previous Kalinikos. It's not analytic, so you cannot just plug a uh, formula and get answer. You need to find uh, eigenvalues of uh, matrix and so on. But principally dispersion looks like it's shown here. Uh, inside there is this uh, parameters like key capital squared, but this is our key x is uh, along the waveguide and kappa it's our quantization perpendicular to the waveguide and in there there are two demagnetization factors so previously one was ignored but here we have fyy and fzz it's a function of kx and this kx for example it can be found it depends on this matrix and x of this tensor which you can find here inside you have f f you have here how to find it and uh, also you need uh, sigma staying here in F, which uh, again can be found. So principally sigma is needed and effective widths. Actually effective widths is an issue. It's uh, possible to find for purely pinned cases. So for some, uh, uh, for particular cases, this uh, G and sigma can be found explicitly, analytically. Uh, for the cases when uniform mode, when g is equal simply 1, for case when we have, can describe this one g as a cosine, uh, that's symmetric, kind of pinned case, and this is sine, it's anti-symmetric. So some, some big analytical formula, and here you have factor width, and here you have the sigma. Uh, yeah, but let us go to the result, how you do it. If you, so all this is described in supplementary materials, uh, to this paper, where you can see how to calculate it properly. And uh, here is the result, as I have shown, said you, this is a dispersion, this dashed line, so it describes uh, numericals, uh, numerical simulations good, so it means that it works, but it also can describe user profiles of mode. 
So that's this dash points, this red points, these are simulations and lines, this is analytics. And you see that we have it for one micron, we have this partially pinned case, uh, first mode, second mode, third mode, and uh, or zero mode, first mode, second mode. So here we tried to be consistent. We gave uh, name uh, numbering exactly like for the nano waveguide, because here it's zero mode, first and second, because we simply have this transmission from, you, you change slightly width and you see transmission from this mode to this one. And we didn't want, of course, to change the number of this mode because it's still the same mode, just uh, changes this profile. But principally, that's what you need to know uh, for the, um, how to calculate nano wave guides and you have the source. So now I'm going to speak about micromagnetics. Very powerful tool. I am not the proper person to speak about micromagnetics uh, because there are many experts from the in micromagnetics from the people kind of star level. It's uh, Thomas Schreffel, it's uh, Attila Kakai, for example, I can name Philip Piro is very strong in this Chivank who was calculated uh, for us, Ricardo Hertel. Dieter Zeus here at our faculty, and he has now a powerful team of people, Klaus Abbert, for example, uh, Florian Bruckner, Sabri Karaltan, Andre Vorono from our group is working with, uh, trained also by functional materials, how to do numerics. So there are many properly, uh, uh, very serious people in numerics, and I'm experimentalist. But nowadays we need to rely on numerics. So principally, many of our last papers, we do simultaneously theory, usually from Roman Verba, experiment and numerics. And only then we can answer all questions. So in my uh, lecture, I will just give you a taste what is micromagnetics, why it's pow powerful and which codes you can use. So principally, this is a picture from Ricardo Hertel, which speaks about lenses, lens scales for micromagnetism. Uh, here, 10 to the power minus 10 meter, principally you are sitting already on in the quant, uh, in the atom physics, so atomic scale lens, uh, electron theory, quantum physics, it's all here. And the problem in principle are initial different kind of calculations, and this is of course very powerful. So we have uh, it's used in all probable fields of physics. But if you need to calculate some large more macroscopic sample, and you will try to calculate each concrete atom, uh, there will be not enough computing power for your computer. So we won't be able to do it. Therefore, uh, micromagnetics, what it does, it splits your sample into such domains and it considers in such regions, it uh, simulates Sol's landau lipschitz gilbert equation for each domain. So kind of introducing some clusterization, so, so some macro spin, and then you can describe also very large uh, samples, still with real, realistic simulation power and so on. Here on the right side, there is also domain theory, so you can uh, deal with domains, so it will be even larger scale, but micromagnetics usually is used to describe this domain. So for cell size, for domain, for micromagnetics should be smaller, of course, the domain, that you can get this picture. Uh, there are two types of, the, of uh, micromagnetics. One is named finite difference uh, and another finite element code. A finite difference means that you take your sample and you split it into rectangle shape clusters. And finite element, it means that you use this more complicated mesh, like ComSol is using, for example, and so on for other tasks. What are the difference? Of course, this one is better if you need to describe such a circular or so some not rectangular structures or 3D structures. So mesh, uh, finite element is good. But finite element uh, is usually slower and consumes much more memory. Therefore, majority of micromagnetic simulations is there's still uh, people using finite difference element and uh, finite different code and here, because it's rectangular, you can easily kind of, uh, when you can go into the key space uh, through Fourier transformation, 
there are some tricks how you can optimize a solving of errors and interaction of cells between themselves. The, for this one, it's usually faster and, uh, um, and consumes less energy. Of course, you might get troubles at the edges, but uh, in many cases, practical cases, it's no problem. You just uh, quantize it like it's shown and it still works. In some other cases, so with Philip Piro, we were investigating, and Chivank, we were investigating uh, some nonlinear effects in a ring resonator, and then this edge effect was critical. So then you need to stick to finite elements. Therefore, just always check which kind of code you would like to work with and how micromagnetics works. So this is a slide uh, Eater Zeus kindly sent me, which uh, shows the general idea. So principally it solves uh, landau lipschitz gilbert equation for each of the cells. So this is how landau lipschitz can be written. We're taking into account damping. This alpha is a damping parameter. And here you see this effective field. And within this effective field, you put different contributions. In particular, exchange contribution, like we have discussed previously, anisotropy of different kind, we also discussed, Zeeman energy, simply minus BH, but very important is DMAC, because this DMAC principally is taking into account interaction between different cells, so kind of you need to take into account DMAC static and the dynamic from different cells. And yes, and then you more or less solve any equations, and at the end of the day, you can get any information. So some people name that numerics, it's not theory, it's experiment. And it's really, in many cases, very similar, more similar to experiments than to analytics, because your job is to make a proper code, to test it, that it, you trust it, that everything is good, and then you just change parameters and you see what's going on. Therefore, it's a very powerful tool to understand. If you measure something strange, what we cannot understand, then we immediately do numerics and trying to see if it's the same or not. And then we can say uh, what kind of physics is there or what this kind of troubles is there. Uh, so if to compare between analytics and uh, numerics, so in analytics, it's a linearization of LLG for small deflections from the ground state. It's transformation in the LLG into the wave vector space. It's more or less what uh, Kalinko Slavin did. And solving of the LLG in the wave vector space for vanishing excitation fields FK. So it's more or less how to get, yeah, so and then you will get this dashed line, for example, it's a dispersion curve. And numerics, you do solve in the LLG after linear excitation in the real space. So M as function of R and time real space, so coordinate in time. Then you usually f transform it to the, with Fourier transformation, to the um, reciprocal space, uh, from real space to reciprocal wave vector space. So M is a function of K and F. And then you can get a dispersion out of there. And afterwards, you can, of course, use different algorithms, one, how from this color code you can get more or less line to get your dispersion curve. Um, here is a picture of what you can do with micromagnetics taken from the PhD thesis of Chi Wang. Uh, he defended his thesis in Kaiserslautern. So, uh, and then he, now he's professor in Wuhan. So he left our group in Vienna recently, a very successful scientist. And he, this is in his thesis where he made a very nice overview of what is going on. So first, you have this grid you have some excitation points, so you can apply, for example, RF field in one of these grids. And then if you can see it, then you will have MZ as a function of time, X and Y, so real time and real coordinate. And then already from here, principally you could get from, after you perform simulations, you can perform, get this distribution of magnetization in real space. So this is X and Y. And uh, on the color code, it's spin wave amplitude in some uh, arbitrary units, blue minus one, red plus one. So it also shows your face, yeah? Up and down. What you can do afterwards, you can do, for example, uh, you can fix some of the coordinate of y is equal to some ym, some of them, and then you will have value, uh, and you do f f fast Fourier transformation along x axis, then you will get mz as a function time, kx and ym, time, Kx and spin wave intensity. So principally, it's kind of some information from um, uh, wave number space, but also time. But what's 
or what you can do another after you do phosphoric transformation a long time, you will st stack to the M as a function frequency and coordinates. And then if you fix some frequency, you can plot amplitude of spin wave as a function of uh, coordinates, X and Y. Yeah? So how for given frequency, how it's distributed over the sample. If you do phosphoric transformation along Y, uh, which is interesting, that's where spin wave propagates and you fix some Y, uh, sorry, along X and you fix some Y, you fix some perpendicular uh, K vector, then you will get our dispersion curve. That's what we need. It's a frequency as a function of KX. What else you can do? You can summarize all of them, then you will get just frequency spectrum in any cell. You can uh, take FFT along both X and Y directions, and you will have frequency <coughs> over the X axis and KX and Y, you will get 2D dispersion. And uh, of course you can make also FFT along Y and then you will get dispersion but when here staying not the k propagating along the waveguide, but k perpendicular to the waveguide. So principally, as you see, you can get any information from your code as soon as you have a numerical sim uh, as, you, as soon as you do numerical simulations. So which codes people use? First of all, it's oomph. It was classical. Uh, uh, simulations were very powerful five, ten years ago. I think everybody was using OOMF, but it's based on CPU and it's very slow. Uh, then there was developed this uh, GPU accelerated micromagnetism, MUMAX 3. It's open source and nowadays I think the majority of people use MUMAX. It's a very powerful tool. Also this, this, this all is MUMAX. Uh, it's also properly optimized. It's fast and good code and well tested. Um, we have at our faculty, so in the group of Dieter Zeus, was developed Magnum NP, and it's principally, of a, recently it was optimized significantly, and uh, it's, uh, in from some tasks, it gives the same speed as um, uh, MUMAX, uh, and, but this one has a set of advantages, therefore I want, would like just to promote it a bit. First of all, you can use also GPU if you want, or you can use CPU. It's all in Python and it's all open source on this uh, GitLab. So here there are some links. This slide uh, Dieter sent me. And uh, it's carefully written in Python and nowadays more and more researchers use Python. Therefore you can easily modify it, introduce changes to the code to do it that what you want. It's uh, very good for inverse problems for topology optimization. So nowadays people more and more interested in inverse design machine learning and so on. It looks like it's a super powerful mechanism and this Magnum NP uh, is uh, very good to introduce in word design and uh, people are working already to do it. So there is explicit and implicit time integration. So there are, this is some uh, routine how you do new numerics if you take into account all the information from previous events or also that what is going on on the next st time step. So let's say I don't go into the details, but uh, you have freedom here. You have freedom to change parameters. You can introduce spin to orbit torque. So in addition to classical micromagnetics, which works with fields, uh, the max and so on, you can also introduce spintronics. And uh, Markus Gattringer also uh, published, uh, PG student of Dieter Zeus recently, that they introduced also spin pumping, inverse spin hole effect. So principally you can do micromagnetics with spintronics with this code. Um, uh, for, for us also very important that they have recently developed a possibility, imagine that you need to simulate very thick magnetic layer and turn very thin one. And cell, the size of cell size, uh, the size of cell size is usually a big issue. Actually I forgot to say how large, say, how large should be this cell size. So if you will ask proper numerics person, he or she will tell you that this uh, cell size should be of the order of exchange lengths. So for YIC, it's 15 nanometer, if I remember right. So usually people work with 10 by 10 nanometer cell size because then exchange interaction can be described properly. But I should say that in some cases, uh, when we work with magnetostatic waves, very big wavelengths, this, uh, we don't need some such a big discretization because I have seen simulations, successful simulations of the five micron thick, two centimeter long 
two millimeter white wave guide. And it's, you still can do it with uh, micromagnetic. So of course you need to take into account huge uh, un uh, unit cell, uh, so it's large cell size, but then exchange kind of will be sleeping anyway because you also work with large wavelengths, but uh, magnetostatic waves still will be uh, described. Yeah, and uh, in some cases we need to calculate, um, uh, for example, six sample and thin sample, and then we need to change lattice size, uh, ideally. And normally micromagnetics doesn't allow you, but with magnum you can do it. You can use larger cell size for thicker sample and smaller cell size for thinner. It's also a big advantage. Um, yeah, so this is a standard problems in micromagnetics. They have this uh, interesting approach that somewhere you can find uh, standard problems. And if you have written new code, first what you do, you just test how your code works, if you can reproduce that what is uh, given there. And yeah, very important, as I said, simple modification of the code. You can just uh, change everything you want in a, a very comfortable manner and use it for yourself. And for example, uh, you can use, uh, uh, describe, for example, behavior, dynamics or statics, even in such very complicated compounds, which contains of grain. That's what a group of functional materials of Dieter is, uh, is doing. And they actually have also, besides a magnum NP, they have also magnum PI, which is finite element code. But this one is used more in the terms of joint research projects with them. Okay, so much. One more code, it's not really micromagnetics, but very popular, Tetra-X. So it's done by Lukas Korber and Attila Kakai, the group of Attila Kakai in Dresden, Rosendorf. Uh, getting more and more popular, also our groups start using it, and I see that colleagues are using, so it's very nice code. It, but it's not truly micromagnetics, it's some quasi-analytics, I would say. I hope Attila will be happy if I say it like that. And what it does, it uh, first of all, it considers such a very long waveguides and it doesn't solve them everything. It solves, uh, works only in such a plane, which is split into some elements. And it doesn't solve landau lifshitz equation in the uh, real time space, but it works with eigenvalues, so it's converted into frequency domain and it uh, operates, uh, solves uh, equations already in the uh, in that uh, space, and um, and it's uh, actually very fast because of this. Uh, so it, it means that it cannot solve maybe some nonlinear tasks. So it has many limitations. But if you want to calculate simply dispersion, uh, then it's a very powerful tool because it's very fast. Will calculate you uh, dispersion in. Uh, even complicated waveguide, or this is an example for just, an, uh, just a waveguide of 29 nanometer wide, some width. Yeah, and here you see profiles of spin wave, uh, different numbers. So this uh, is zero mode, first width mode, second width mode, third width mode, and so on. So you can calculate profile of the mode in the waveguide, and you can uh, calculate frequency versus wave number. So this is a dispersion which we need, which is a topic of this discussion. And you see here is there eigensolver, there, there is analytical theory and there is some experiment. So principally, I would, uh, it's also open source, I would attract your attention to this code, looks very nice. Uh, one more, uh, it's not micromagnetics, but it's such a very powerful pocket uh, uh, kind of, uh, program which is developed by, uh, so it's actually spin-off, uh, Milan and uh, Pascal Frey and, and Philip Piro. Uh, they used it in, um, developed in the two Kaiserslautern group of uh, magnetism. And uh, it's named AI Sericon, I think I read it correct. Uh, so, what, so I want to attract you to this uh, packet. It's not micromagnetics, but it's more or less um, interface which you can use to make your life easier in micromagnetics. So in micromagnetics, one of the problems is uh, that you need to deal with a lot of data and you need to process it. Uh, a lot of data and um, post-processing is an issue because if you have terabytes of yeah, data after one simulation, you need somehow to do something. 
And uh, pretty often micromagnetics is used to uh, run similar kind of experiments to find some optimization. And it all works very good if you have a super talented uh, PhD student. Uh, but if not, this packet can help you. Uh, what it does principally, it's just such a smart system uh, where you first have to choose some simulation models. You create more or less in text file parameters which you want to plug or parameters which uh, which you want to change. I want to change frequency or fields or whatever. In some easy code, you can do it. Then it will either select on its own or you will select which code. It can use any micromagnetics or Tetra X, new Max, it can be Boris, I don't know what this is, sorry. Uh, but uh, Magnum can be used here. So you can simulate whatever you want. Afterwards, there will be Python code which will post-process everything and will subtract that information which is needed for you. And uh, you, will visual, uh, you will get visualization dependencies of what you need and what you need. And then principally there can be artificial intelligence based uh, ex extraction uh, for, to process data. For example, you can dis uh, subtract uh, uh, dispersions if it's uh, what you need, but it can do any other uh, uh, tasks. And here they just sent me uh, this example. For example, you can ask it to simulate these two coupled waveguides, so-called directional coupler, then it did all the job, then it has calculated dispersions so in this coupled waveguides. Uh, dispersion will be split into symmetric and asymmetric modes, like it's shown here. And then finally it uh, got these lines, so there you got dispersion in this particular case. So principally also pay attention to this. You can always write an email to Philip or to any other co-founder and to ask for more questions if you have. Good. Other questions? No, good. But I still hope this overview will be interesting for you and useful. And last, my message, it's very little part. It's very simple. Uh, message that before we, we just discussed waveguides and we first we discussed plane film and quantization over the thickness. Then we went to the waveguide and said that you need to take into account quantization over the width and quantization over the thickness also in some cases. But my message is that if you have not a rectangular waveguide or sample but you have more complicated uh, more complicated uh, samples or arrays or whatever you still can have quantization, but its idea is the same. You just need more or less to have standing waves. Just uh, check where it is. This, I want to attract your attention to this paper, Democrito Hillebrand Slavin. It's uh, about BLS, principally brain light scattering spectroscopy is well described here, but also they describe such an array, for example, with all the results in the array of interacting permalloy wires of width 1.5 micron, separation of 0.7 micron. And uh, then what they have seen, uh, principally this would be a Damon Eschbach mode in such a waveguide propagating. But in, the, in addition, you will have quantization such a width mode standing. And that's what they have seen, so Q parallel again, so Q means K here. Uh, sometimes people use Q to define the wave number. And then you have n equal 0, n equal 1, 2, 3, and so on, all these modes, which were measured by a uh, key result, brilliant light scattering spectroscopy. So you can have quantization in array of such uh, strips. This is from a paper, for example, just as an example from Adekundle Adeyeye, where they investigated nano disks. So as soon as you have disk, as you, you can see it very well, but you again will have quantization. But now instead of having like width and length quantization, if you would have take resonator, yeah, if you would cut your waveguide, you also would have quantization along. Here they have radial and azimuthal modes. So it means that here you have a such quantization from center to the edge. Yeah, so radial and but also there will be quantization. It looks like flower when you fix radius and you move around you will see that there will be quantization over this one. And it all depends strongly how you magnetize your, uh, your disk, if it um, has vortex, so-called, when it's in the center, magnetization is pointing up and then it's down. Or you have onion state, when you magnetize it simply with big field, 
magnetizations and goes like this. There are different kind of configurations, different modes, but just keep in mind that there will be also different kind of magnetization. There are many papers about it. Uh, another example, for example, um, of Romanian Barman, uh, who, uh, so here and coasters, here they studied quantization in a ring. So you have ring with some hole, there will be some width, some thickness, and again, you can have many different modes depending how they magnetized. So it means how large is field applied, in which direction, you can have different kind of quantization and it means different modes and so on. Therefore, just always pay attention is which sample you're working, where you can get quantization, and how it influences your result. And that was my last slide for today. Other questions? You're very silent today. Everything was very clear, I think. That's good. <laughs> good. Okay, so then I suppose my job was to give you an overview and to, to give you hints where to move and how to calculate dispersions. I think the mission is accomplished. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention.